Our missionary in focus tonight is the Rio Grande Bible Institute down in Texas. When Brother Merlin was alive, he used to support them. Uh, we do uh, put out on our missionary board out there a monthly missionary that we support in this local or national and a one that's international. And this month, the Rio Grande Bible Institute is our focus. So afterwards, if you want to go read the letter that they sent out, but I was just reading it before the service. Um, they primarily train people to go to Latin America, Latin speaking, uh, so Spanish speaking churches in Central America and South America to spread the gospel. And isn't that great that we can do that in the United States, that we can send people, uh, teach them a, a language or the language they already know and then send them out. They also have a radio ministry, which is very effective when you're near the country of Mexico that you can broadcast and people in Mexico can hear the gospel in their heart language. So let's pray for the Rio uh, Grande Bible Institute. Our passage this month is, has been Matthew chapter 6 that we're focusing on. Um, there's a lot of different parts of it uh, that we can look at. What God is looking for here is, is motive. When we give, why do we give? Because you can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and it, you, you, you lose credit for it. It's wrong. And the Pharisees, if you, and the scribes, if you look at them in the New Testament, they weren't going out and blatantly, openly doing wrong. They weren't committing adultery and, and murder. But what they were doing is they were being religious with prideful attitudes. They were arrogant. They were saying, look at me. And so Jesus warns in the Sermon on the Mount that you take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. So when it doesn't mean you can't do things in front of people, but when you do it, it's not so, you can get, check me out. I remember when I was in the Marine Corps, there were people that would only work when the boss showed up. And as soon as the boss walked out, they went back to their old ways. Uh, the good thing is God's always there, so you're not fooling him, okay? Uh, otherwise, you don't have a reward from your father in heaven, he says. He says, but when you do do your deeds, don't let your, um, so don't be a hypocrite, but don't sound trumpets in front of you like, the, like they did like the, uh, like in the synagogues. Uh, they already have their glory. They already have their reward. But he says, that when he says, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, and that's a figure of speech saying when you do something, uh, it should be in private. It should be done in secret. Um, it shouldn't be, check me out. Look what I've done. Here's the check I'm dropping into the, you know, none of that kind of stuff. And then he says, if you do that, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Would you rather be rewarded by God or by man? That's what you have to look at. So I, I'm, as you give it up, as you do give, um, and we, we don't pass the plate anymore, but offering boxes online in the mail, it's been wonderful to see how God continues to provide uh, through your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for the Rio Grande Bible Institute and their work with Spanish-speaking peoples, uh, not only in Texas, but in, in South America and Latin America and Central America. We pray that you would continue to work in the hearts of the men and women that you have called there. Uh, Lord, as they get the gospel out, that we can see things like we've seen tonight, people getting saved and baptized, Lord, so the Great Commission can continue to go. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 28. I thought about finishing the book tonight, but that would have been pushing it. Um, getting to Rome. is not that been Paul's big goal uh, for the last few years as we've been going through Acts? Did you ever get to a place you just couldn't wait to get to? Or think back when you were a child. Christmas was coming. Usually about September, October, you began to look forward to, well, I grew up in New York, so when the, when the snow started coming down, September, October, we started thinking about Christmas. And even back then, the decorations would be in the store in September. Now, I guess you can go to Hobby Lobby and get your Christmas decorations, but as you began to anticipate, and it got closer and closer, you got excited. Or when I was in boot camp, because I joined the Marine Corps because I got tired of being told what to do, and so when I showed up, I realized that I'd made a huge mistake and so the first night as I'm looking in the mirror, I remember 84 days in a wake-up, 83 days in a wake-up, 82 days in a wake-up. It kept getting closer and closer, and we just couldn't wait to graduate. This is kind of how I see Paul. Paul has been, God told Paul twice in the previous chapters that he would live to stand before Caesar to give testimony before the, the main ruler of the world at the time. And so Paul has gone through some difficult times. Last week we looked at 
uh, his, uh, we call the God leads, Paul leads, and we looked at the leadership qualities of an effective godly leader. We looked at how God used a humble man uh, who was a prisoner to lead 276 people uh, to safety. He promised them the ship would be destroyed, the cargo would be destroyed, but they would live. And that's where he left off last week at the end of uh, chapter 27 and verse 44, and the rest, on, some on board, some on parts of the ship. And so it was they all escaped safely. And on your handout, I've given you the same map that we looked at uh, last week. They are on the island of Malta. That's in your bottom left of your, of your map right there. That's where they shipwrecked to. So in these first 16 verses of Acts 28, we're going to look at them being there, and we're going to see them start working their way up to Rome. But God's not done with Paul yet. This, this over two-year journey, he's been uh, working in Paul's life. And you've noticed in your life probably that you have this goal, I want to get to here, I, this is where I want to get to, and God keeps putting hiccups and bumps I wrote a paper when I was going through seminary. The bumps are what you climb on, look, looking at Abraham's life. And sometimes when we, we're, in a, we're, in a, we're in a hurry to get to the goal, and we don't see all the, the things that are in between. But God puts those there intentionally so that we'll learn to, to trust him and that we can have effective ministry all, along the way. So let's look at Acts chapter 28. We're just going to read the first 16 verses tonight before we... We jump into uh, the chapter here. Now, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us curiously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island <coughs> excuse me, who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled round and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appia Forum and Three Inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Like I said, he's finally gotten to where he wanted to go. But God had a three-month hiccup for him. Thank you. It's not that, brother. It was the, it's the flowers. They're a, they're a little potent. So let's look at, and I, I, I grabbed this, author from, this outline from John MacArthur as I was looking at trying to outline, I was like, he did it better than I could ever do, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm just going to give credit to the person who did it. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at, if you remember last week we looked at leadership, we want to look at how God uses the unsaved to bless his people, and then how God also plants churches all, all, along the way. So we're going to look at pagan hospitality, potential harm with the snake there, public healing, the promise honored, and private housing. 
And I, all of this shows how God is working. If, if you have learned anything as we've gone through the book of Acts, I hope you've realized that God is sovereign, that God's in control of circumstances, of people. The Bible says even the, 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 the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turns it whatever way he wants. Proverbs 21.1. God's in charge. And sometimes we forget that. We think we have to help him along the way. Have you ever tried to help God and messed it up royally? I know I have. But let's look at the first two verses, pagan hospitality. So imagine 276 people. They've gone through a two-week storm. They're wet. Did you get wet at all yesterday in that rain? And they're cold, and they're on this island, a strange island, and they are showed, and I like the way it says here, uh, the King James, I think it says, says, no unusual kindness. Here it says, they showed us unusual kindness. What, what's the idea here? These foreign people, these, these natives, had such compassion upon Paul and the other 275 people, that they took care of them. Hospitality is, is really important. Now, Malta here, if you look at that map, it's about 58 miles south of the island of Sicily. Sicily, as we work our way up towards Italy, is an island off the bottom. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. Uh, almost everybody in my neighborhood came from the island of Sicily. We've got cities up there like Messina, that, that, that's one of the straits that go through there. And a lot of the cities are named after Sicilian cities. So I kind of, I, I kind of like this where you, you, you see God um, working in lives of people whose ancestors eventually came to my hometown uh, and, they were, and they received the gospel. So, um, by the way, you know what the, the name Malta means? It means a place of refuge. And I, I think it's appropriate to name it. This is not the first ship that probably had to stop there uh, after the storm. As you go on these these little boats working through these uh, difficult storms, especially at certain times of the year, they found harbors where they could to, to winter. And they're going to spend three months here. And the natives uh, are going to show them tremendous kindness. It's November. It's cold. They're wet. It's windy. And what they do is they start a fire. Makes sense, right? It wasn't like they could turn the heater on like we can do, or so that they couldn't put their clothes on. All that stuff they had was thrown overboard, and everything else they had that they're wearing is all wet. And so the people uh, start a fire for them. They're exhausted, they're drenched, and they're very um, happy to receive this hospitality. And so as I was thinking about this uh, and, and looking through the rest of the scripture about the concept of hospitality, Hospitality is a big thing in Scripture. It's required of church leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, when it's talking about the qualifications of a pastor, one of the qualifications is they are given to hospitality. A pastor who doesn't want to be around people, who's not hospitable, is not qualified uh, for that, that ministry. Titus chapter 1, verse 8 says the same thing. So when God looks at church leaders, he's looking for hospitality. You say, well, that's great, Mark. I'm not a church leader. Okay, look at Romans chapter 12, verse 13, a couple, uh, one book earlier there. I mean, next, one book later, Acts, Romans. And God says this, uh, in verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. That's talking about all Christians. If you're familiar with Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And if you keep going down the chapter, this is one of the things that God says that all Christians should be. We should be given to hospitality. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 2, it talks about being hospitable because some people have unknowingly um, given hospitality to angels. And, and that was a, a commendatory thing. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 9. I was just looking at this before, so I didn't write all the verses down. It says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. 
Did you ever, did you ever want to be hospitable? Did you ever, you ever say, okay, here. You're nice to somebody, but you're not real, your heart's not really in it. God says he wants you to be hospitable, and he wants your heart to be right. Now, here's a bunch of unsaved people being hospitable towards Christians. And to me, that just shows uh, that the moral law of God is written on the hearts of mankind. If you read Romans uh, chapter 2, Paul says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? And then earlier on in that chapter, therefore you are without excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourselves, for you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same things yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You know what God's saying here? The unsaved people and have the moral law of God, and they know how to be kind. I've noticed in my life a lot of times, uh, I did a funeral yesterday, and I, and I don't believe the family was saved just based on my interaction with them. Uh, but there were some very kind gestures that were done towards each other, um, towards the church. They gave a nice gift. How can unsaved people be kind? Because the moral law of God is written in their heart. So, Mark, why is that a big deal to me? Well, if unsaved people can do that, shouldn't believers who have the Spirit of God living within them practice hospitality? We've seen the commands in Scripture. It's something that we should do. And so I just love the fact that these people took care of Paul. Now, why did they do that ultimately? Because God wanted them to. God's going to get Paul to Rome. And God promised Paul that all 276 people were going to make it there alive. And so God, in his sovereignty and in his providence, allowed them to crash at this side at this time in order to be taken care of. I remember one time my car broke down. It broke down at a gas station. At that gas station, there happened to be a mechanic who knew all about my type of car. He just happened to have the part that I needed to fix my car. People would say, you're really lucky. I'm not lucky. That's the sovereignty of God. That's God allowing something to happen at a particular time in a particular way. There is no luck. Proverbs, I think it's 16.33, talks about the casting of lots. We can do that, but God is in control even of the outcome of that. He's in charge. So we go from the hospitality to potential harm. So the first thing I see here, not only is the hospitality, but look at the humility of Paul. Paul is gathering sticks. He's shivering, cold. Now you say, yeah, but Mark, he's had practice. He's been in the sea before and a night and a day, but that doesn't mean you're not going to be cold. But he is not so above everyone else in his mind that he's not willing to pick up sticks with everybody else. And you think Satan is trying to take out Paul? You think Satan wants Paul to get to Rome? He absolutely does not. And so as Paul is picking up the sticks, he, he throws them into the fire, and all of a sudden one of the sticks moves. It's a viper, and it bites Paul. Now, look at the reaction of the people. What's the very first thing they thought about Paul when the viper attached to his hand? says they thought he was a murderer. And that was it. And it talks about the fact that um, no doubt this man is a murderer, verse 4, uh, whom though he has escaped to see, yet justice does not allow to live. Now that word justice, we think of justice uh, as, this is, a, this is one of their gods. The word is DK. It's one of their gods. They think that one of their gods is, is, is punishing Paul because obviously he's a murderer, and, and God's getting him back. The, the modern terminology is karma got you. It's not biblical terminology, but you might hear some of your friends use that phrase. Or uh, you got what was coming to you. And so they believed that if something happened to you, you earned it. You deserved it. So the snake is attached to him. It's a, it's a poisonous viper. They expected him to die. Look at Paul's reaction. Does he spaz out? Is that still a word, spaz? Does he overreact? 
He just goes, flick, and where's the snake go? In the fire. Now, the people are watching Paul saying, he should be kicking the bucket and he did waiting for him to start shaking. They know about these vipers. They know about the poison. And what is Paul's uh, reaction? He just stands there. And all of a sudden they realize he's not going to die. He's not even going to show any reaction at all. So he goes from being a murderer in their eyes, which, by the way, they're 100% completely wrong, to being what? A god. You ever notice how the world can be wrong in so many ways? They were wrong. Paul is obviously not a murderer, although he was before he got saved. And he's obviously not a god. He's just working for God. But what I see here is the potential of harm. As we're doing what the Lord wants us to do, we're not promised that we're going to avoid snake bites. By the way, that was a literal prediction in, in Mark chapter 16, I think it's around verse 18, that if you drink poison, you'll be okay to tell the apostles. And if, um, let, me, let, me read, let me read the exact verse so I, so I quote it properly to you. Uh, I think it's 16, 18. Yes, talking about the disciples. He says, um, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And this is talking about the apostles. And by the way, Paul was an apostle, and guess what happened? Got bit by a serpent, and he lived. Just a fulfillment of that prophecy. They mistook him for a god. They mistook him for a murderer. The potential for harm was there. And what did our God do? He protected them. You're not going to die a day before you're supposed to. And you're not going to live a minute longer than you are supposed to. How do I know that? God's in charge. He's in charge of time. He's in charge of death and hell. He's in charge of life. And uh, so that, to me, is very relaxing, very freeing. I don't worry because I know God's in charge. If he takes me before I finish this sentence, see you in heaven. What are you going to threaten me with, right? If he allows me to live to be 80 or 90, and you beat me there, I'll see you when I get there. God's in charge. In verses 7 to 11, because the people were hospitable and Paul was humble to pick up those sticks and, and God protected him, Paul is not done. Paul is now going to heal. Remember, he's staying at Publius' house for three days. So imagine, a, it must have been a pretty good-sized house. I know I get a little bit uh, concerned when I, I, I say the kids are coming over and we've got to find bedrooms for three grandkids and uh, uh, and a daughter and and their husband, or if both uh, sets of grandkids show up, i got six grandkids and two husbands and two wives, that can be kind of taxing in the house. Imagine 276 people showing up to your house. I'm thinking Publius had a pretty good size estate uh, because it says he was able to do this. And he was able to entertain them for three days until they can find winter quarters. It was probably temporary. And then I'm guessing amongst the people on the island, they, they kind of divvied up uh, the 276 people and gave them places to stay. And so what Paul does is he hears about Publius's father that he's sick of fever and dysentery. And so Paul goes into him. He prays for the man. He lays his hands on him. And... He heals him. Why do you think that's important? Why would God write this in the scripture? What does it show about the heart of God? It shows that God cares for people. Here is a man's father who just happened to show kindness towards Paul and his people, and he's sick, and Paul prays for him, touches him, and the man gets healed. That shows the heart of God. Does God care when people are sick? When we pray, like we did for Brother George Witten and for other people that are sick, are we just throwing words at the ceiling and they're bouncing off? Or does Jesus care? He absolutely cares. He says, cast all your cares upon him. He cares for us. God's the God who hears and answers prayer. As we went through the Gospel of Luke over those four or five years, you remember over and over again, Jesus would do some simple thing like, I don't know, feed 5,000 people who just happened to be out there, and they were hungry. He cared enough to take care of their, their needs. He shows up at a funeral, 
and just he, see, he sees the mother crying and heals the son. He sees a blind man and gives him vision. He sees a lame man and allows him to walk. Now, does that mean that every person who's sick will be healed? No. Why? Because God may have a different purpose. And by the way, we're all eventually going to get sick and die from something. Because the wages of sin is death. It, it, the human condition is death. And you don't want to go to heaven, and you can't go to heaven in this body. God's going to give you a new one. Read 1 Corinthians 15. The mortal's going to put on immortal. The corruptible put on incorruptible. And then, I think it's Philippians talks about we're going to get out of this vile body. Think about that terminology. This vile body and, and, get, and get a new one. So we're all going to die from something. But sometimes God just says, you know what? I want to show some grace. I want to show some mercy. So he heals him. And when he finished, verse 9, the rest of those on the island who had a disease showed up. I mean, think about it. Hey, we got a guy here who can heal everybody. Imagine the state of medicine in, the, in Paul's day, the kind of things that they practiced. Here's genuine healing going on. Now, what do you think Paul did? Now, this is not mentioned here, but every other time in the book of Acts, and when Jesus' ministry, whenever he healed, what did they do immediately after? What did Jesus do? What did Peter do? Excuse me. What did Paul do? They preached the gospel. And I firmly believe, and I, see, I think we can see this in verse 10, that many people became believers. We can see it implicitly. How do I know that? They honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So when they left, they had to get a new ship. Provisions for 276 people to go from point A, about 158 miles up to Rome, with several stops on the way. So anything that they needed. Now, what would cause a person to, do, to want to do that? It implied is the gospel was preached and people were saved. If you know anything about Paul, if you've been following the book of Acts, what did he do constantly? Preach the gospel. So I believe, and church tradition says that Publius was the first leader of the church of Malta. That's interesting. He's going to go to Syracuse for three days. Church tradition says he started a church there. Now, you think church planning is, it takes us months. <laughs> Paul goes up, preaches the gospel, God gives fruit, and a whole bunch of people get saved. I think that's implied in the passage. But he spent three months there in the winter. It wasn't safe for them to travel. They didn't tempt God. Did you ever try to rush God and, and be in a hurry? You know what you're supposed to do, but I want to get it done yesterday. So I'm going to do what I can do to manipulate the facts and uh, to manipulate the circumstances so I can get from point A to point B in my time. And every time I've done that, I've messed it up. It's been difficult. Paul waited on the Lord. When the time was right, he, favor was granted by the people that were there, the ship, all the provisions, and everything just kind of clicked. And that's how you can tell when God's working. Everything just kind of works out. It doesn't mean there's not a storm, but it means God just kind of weaves you through the storm and, and you can see him take care of you. Verses 12 to 15, the promise is going to be honored. Let's look at So after three months, they sailed, the, the Alexandrian ship there. Talks about the head, a figurehead. Uh, depending on your translation, you may, uh, it may say the twin brothers are there. And those are Castor and Pollux, if you're familiar with mythology, uh, Greek mythology, they were the sons of Zeus. And they, the, they believed, the Greeks believed that the, the, the Castor and Pollux protected those who were on the ship. So they're on a pagan ship with pagan gods. But who's the real God that's protecting them along the way? The Lord Jesus Christ. They landed Syracuse. So if you follow the map there, you can see it's, it, it's in, it, Syracuse is in Sicily. When they get there, um, they stop for three days, and then they circle around. So they start for Syracuse. They go up around the, the east coast and pop down to Regium. They stay there for a day when the, the wind just happens to blow, and now, now the wind blows them to Puteoli. And God has just given them spot after spot, wind after wind, circumstance after circumstance, to get Paul from point A to point B. Um, Puteoli is about 150 miles from Rome, uh, as the crow flies there. It's the capital's chief seaport. Uh, it's located on the Bay of Naples near Neapolis, modern-day Naples, um, and the city of Pompeii, which was wiped out. In Paul's day, the city was about 100,000 people. And by the way, what do you think Paul found there when he got to Puteoli? We found brethren. And we're invited to stay with them seven days. 
So they got an opportunity to meet some brothers and to uh, encourage each other. And then they worked their way up to the Appia Forum and the Three Inns. Um, that's about 43 miles from Rome. And then when they get uh, at Three Inns, that's about 10 miles from Rome. So Paul's getting closer and closer. And then when they finally get there, notice what he does. He thanks God. God made a promise. God kept the promise. Did you ever thank the Lord for when he answers a prayer? You say, Lord, I want this. And then when you, when you get this, praise God or thank you, Lord. That should be the natural response of, of a believer. And they thank God and they took courage. Now, that took courage means to me, and it, I might be overreading this, that maybe Paul was getting discouraged. He's a human being. Maybe he was getting worn out. This has been going on for several years, this whole process. Maybe as he got closer, he might, might have been getting a little skittish. I don't know what was going on in his heart, but it says he took courage, and he thanked the Lord. And then finally in verse 16, he's housed. All the other prisoners are turned over to the captain of the guard. But what about Paul? Paul's the exception. He is allowed to live in his own house, had his own private soldier who guarded him. He didn't have to live in the same circumstances as everyone else. That's, once again, God showing favor. As I went through this, remember I told you narrative is not normative, which means this actually happened, but not every part of this passage applies to you specifically. But since all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, there are principles from the scripture that we can apply in our own lives. And I've, I've listed those for you six of them. First, here's how God blesses his servants. Last time we looked at leadership. Let's look at how God blesses us in everyday life. Sometimes we don't even think about it. Uh, he surrounds us with kindness. Have you ever been given just acts of kindness by somebody? I go to a, a restaurant here in town. Uh, I go there regularly, and many times they'll just say, we're going to give you the meal for free. That's very kind of them. They don't have to do that. Sometimes God will just bless us with those kinds of things. Well, let me help you out with this. Or there's no charge. Or, or God will have somebody else pay for your meal. That God is just good. And he, he'll do that sometimes. How did God show kindness to Paul? Well, Julia showed Paul kindness by allowing him to uh, go to shore at Sidon back in chapter 27, verse 3. And the Maltese showed him kindness when he landed on the island. And when he gets to Rome, he was shown kindness by allowing allowed to have his own room. Second, God meets the needs of his faithful servants. When he crashed on Publia, uh, excuse me, when he crashed on Malta, Paul didn't have to pull out his master card and say, I need a place to stay. God just happened to have a man there who had the ability to give him clothes, to give him a place to warm up, to give him food. Eventually, the whole island was able to give him everything they needed ship-wise and material-wise to get him to where he needed to go. God meets our needs. Now, he doesn't always meet our wants, and that's a good thing, because if I got everything I wanted, um, I would be selfish and spoiled and not uh, rely upon God. But he gives us what we need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, Matthew 6.33 says. That's the concept. Third, God encourages. Imagine the storm for two weeks that Paul was in, the, in those waves. And uh, he's praying. I guarantee you everybody was praying. The Bible says in Acts 27, we looked at last week, that he sent an angel to, to encourage, to hearten Paul. And uh, the apostle was encouraged by the Roman Christians. As he's getting closer, uh, he saw believers. In verse 14, he, he found some brethren. And they encouraged Paul. And that's really important. God will just give us what we need when we need it. Just kind of when we're at the end of our rope, he says, here's someone to encourage you. Here's someone to bless you. Here's something to bless you. And it kind of just revitalizes you. Fourth, God delivers us from harm. Now, Paul got delivered from three things in this passage. A storm, a shipwreck, and a snake bite. I don't know the things... I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be shocked at the things that God has protected us from. I think I, when I was a young Marine, I wore out quite a few angels the way I used to drive. 
Who knows the the things that God has protected us from over time that we just just don't even realize. I know all of you guys drive well, and I am a much better driver now than I used to be, but I used to ride this far from somebody's bumper at 90 miles an hour and make that, you know, I was a jerk. God protected me. He protected me in combat. He protected me uh, who knows from what. God's in that kind of business. Now, Paul got to see the things that God protected him from. And we should thank God when we see those kinds of things. But we also thank God for the, when we don't see what's going on. He, he knows it. Fifth, God blessed their influence. God blesses our influence. Those 275 other people that were with him on the ship, do you think Paul had a tremendous influence upon them? When they saw how Paul's God answered Paul's prayer and everything that Paul said came to pass. And then they saw Paul heal Publius's father. I, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if we're going to see some of those 276 people in heaven and they became believers on the island of Malta or later on. Wouldn't surprise me one bit. They had tremendous influence. The people on Malta got to see Paul as he went to Syracuse and, and Rigium and Puteoli and has worked his way up to, to Rome. He had influence upon people. And finally, God fulfills our desires. It's Psalm 37, 4 that says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, many people say, I'm going to delight myself in the Lord, and I'm going to get my brand new, I don't pick the car that you want, Lamborghini or, or whatever. I wouldn't want one of those, but I want something I can fit into. But people say, if I delight myself in God, I'm going to get this physical thing that I want. That's extravagant. That's not what the verse means. If I delight myself in the Lord, he will actually give me the proper heart's desires and then fulfill them. We learn that in prayer. As as we pray, what begins to happen is our heart begins to conform to the, the heart of God, and we begin to ask for the things that God would ask for. So when I pray in Jesus' name, I'm saying Jesus himself would pray for the exact same thing. If I delight myself in the Lord... That will happen. Did Paul delight himself in the Lord? Was that his primary focus? Everything in his life after he was saved was, I want to do the Lord's will. And because he did that, yes, he went through some difficult times. Yes, he became a prisoner. Yes, he was shipwrecked and stoned and all those kinds of things. But he never lost the joy of the Lord. And God protected him, showed him kindness, met his needs, encouraged him, delivered him from harm, blessed his influence, and fulfilled his desires. And I believe these principles are still true for Christians today. If we put the Lord first, Matthew 6.33 doesn't change. Okay? Put, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. God must be number one. Now, if we put ourselves first and God is added on to the end, we're going to find our lives aren't going to work as well as we'd like. And a lot of times in counseling, that's what I do is say, well, here's what God wants you to do. Here's what you want to do. You can keep doing what you're doing, but you know the definition of insanity, right? Keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Or you can try it God's way and see how that works for you. And the people that take God's word, take God at his word and apply it, all of a sudden you begin to see lives change. I want to close with this. Earlier this year, uh, I was counseling somebody. I thought their marriage was over. I I mean, I've done a lot of marriage counseling over the years. And what I saw, uh, this was done. I got an email from them about a month later saying, Thanks for coming over to talk with us. Me and my wife did. We spent a lot of time with him. Uh, God has restored our marriage. And you know what happened? Uh, there was nothing else I could do. There was nothing else they could do. And they just finally got smart enough and said, let's do what God tells us to do. And God took a marriage that was, I mean, it was like I thought they were going to throw down at each other to where uh, this couple is doing strong, doing very well. They come to church regularly. God's using them. They're serving in ministry. All because... They did what God told them to do. They put his will first, and then God took care of the rest. Next week, we get to finish Paul off. Not kill him, because the book of Acts ends very abruptly. It, you don't see it really how it ends. It just stops. But what we're going to see is God is faithful. God does what he says. And then in two weeks, we get to do the book of Revelation. And the great thing about the book of Revelation, it's a, it's a book about Jesus. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the theme. He's the author. And we're going to see that what God promised way back in Genesis chapter 3, 
that he would one day crush the serpent's head and that he would, um, that he would take Adam and Eve and that he would restore them someday and, and, and all, all those who followed uh, the, the Savior, he would send a Savior. That he's going to fulfill every one of those 247 allusions to the Old Testament that are in the book of Revelation. He's going to dot the I's and he's going to cross the T's. I want to tell you, we serve a God who keeps his word. We serve a God who if, cannot lie, Titus 1-2 says. A God who is faithful, whose mercies are new every morning. And that's what allows a Paul to keep on going when it's going through a tough time. And that's what allows you and I to keep going when we're going through a tough time. That tough time is we're not promised that we're going to get away from that. that. When I did our prayer today, I read, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What it doesn't say is I will not walk through the valley of shadow of death. Okay? It doesn't, God doesn't say, I'll keep you out of the issue, out of the problem. I'll take it away from you. What he says is, I'll be with you as you go through it. So that, that's how we learn to trust. And that's how God builds our faith. Lord, thank you for your word and what we've learned tonight. We thank you for the baptism that we saw of Gabby, how you're still working in lives. We pray that you would uh, help us to put you first in and, and, and all of our thoughts and our actions, Lord, so that you would be number one and so that, you're, that you would be glorified in all that we do and all that we say. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.